Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. One of the questions that people are asking all across America, I mean, you hear it everywhere you go, basically, is this. What in the world has happened to Kanye West? <laughs> if you don't know who Kanye West is, he's a very well-known uh, entertainer, a famous rapper married to Kim Kardashian. And his songs over the last 20 years have been filled, laced with profanity, uh, wickedness, even Christian mockery, which has made what has happened recently so shocking. It appears he's a changed man, and he's committed his life to Jesus, and he's starting to back it up. For example, the latest album that so many people have been waiting for arrived just last week called Jesus is King number one on iTunes, he's having worship services and concerts that truly lift up Jesus all over uh, the nation and bringing in pastors to preach at those that uh, are giving hard-hitting messages, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of, of mankind and the need for every person to trust Jesus as a savior. And it's pretty exciting, the stuff that's, that's happening. Uh, now, to be sure, it's easy to get skeptical about celebrity conversions, uh, but while time will tell, I'm excited and I'm praying for him and I'm taking him at his word and I'm believing uh, the best about Kanye uh, West, and I hope you are too, uh, as you think about the things that uh, God is using him for at this point. Now, I share this with you because in our study today, Psalm chapter 1 what Kanye West has uh, seen take place in his life and what we're witnessing is this stark contrast, a complete different, completely different person. So too in our text today, there's this stark contrast between wickedness and godliness. And so we're going to jump into that and look at it today. We're in a brand new series uh, through the Psalms. Actually, we're just going to cover four of them, a little mini series. But I anticipate this to keep coming up at different times in our church calendar. We'll come back to the Psalms for a couple of weeks, uh, different points when we want to take a break from something. Psalms, such a great book. So four Psalms we're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, one of my most famous or most popular books for sure is, is the Psalms. I would trust for probably a lot of you, it's if not your favorite, probably in the top five of your favorite books. Reflecting back in my own life and I was writing down what the Psalms have meant to me, I'm not going to share all those things with you, but just all the way back to when I was a little kid and what the Psalms meant to me, how can a young man keep his way pure according to the word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, Psalm 119, 9 and 11. Those times of loneliness, those times when I was afraid. There's Psalms like 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms like 139, where the Lord is before us, he's behind us, he's hovering over the top, and he is uh, the God who's always there with us. He's the God who knit us together in our mother's womb. Those times when uh, I felt lackadaisical in my faith, Psalm 42, a passion for God, like the deer pants for uh, the water brook. Uh, in our parenting uh, years back, uh, the need, Psalm 127, to realize that unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain, and to shoot our kids out like arrows, not in an overprotective kind of a way, but in a way to launch them out uh, powerfully into our world. Um, 
these are just some examples. So many things that God has been showing me for years and years in uh, and through the Psalms. The Psalms were originally meant to be sung. Comes, the word comes from the Greek word psalmos, which means song. Carefully crafted works of art and poetry. Amazing works of art. Uh, one example, just, just quickly, Psalm 119. You probably know that as the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. And that's not random that there's 176 because there's 22 sections of eight verses each. 22 sections, eight verses each. And each of the 22 sections starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So in Psalms 119, 1 through 8, each verse starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph, which is like our A in Hebrew. Then the next eight verses, 9 through 16, starts with Bet, which is our B in the Hebrew alphabet, every single of the next eight verses. And it goes like that all the way through 22 sections. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like how long would it have taken to write this? And we see this pattern in many of the other Psalms as well, an amazing work of art. Psalms was the song book of the early church. In fact, there's churches today that's all they sing are songs from the Psalms. 150 chapters, five different sections, about half written by King David and the other half by various authors, uh, many of which are anonymous. There's different kinds of Psalms. There's Psalms of worship and praise. There's Psalms of prayer and thanksgiving. Some are more personal. Some are more for the congregation. There's songs of lament, which are those hard times in life when God seems distant, seems silent, and the author being emotional and honest before God in those times. Songs of special occasions, the coronation of a king, a wedding, a feast. And one category is what we call wisdom psalms. They're psalms that are instructional, kind of like the Proverbs are. This is how life works. This is how to live life to the fullest. These are some excellent life skills. Uh, we live these skills. Life goes better for us. Wisdom Psalms, and that's where Psalm 1 comes in. Psalms 1, which is the, the gate to all the Psalms, uh, is, a, is a wisdom uh, Psalm, and it's all about the path to life. And that's our title today, The Path to Life. A passionate, life-changing relationship with God. Only six verses uh, you heard them already read uh, before I taught on the screen there. We're going to go a verse at a time, then I'm going to make a few comments. Verse 1, blessed is the one. In other words, happy, the word blessed is life as it's meant to be lived. It means holistic prosperity. And so this, this blessed one, there's one thing they don't do and there's one thing they do. What they don't do is walk in step with the wicked. So as they go through life, they don't make their decisions and base their life on the culture around them. They don't base their decisions on values and lifestyles of those far from God. They don't receive their counsel. So not in step with the wicked or standing in the way that sinners take or sitting, which means to settle in, in the company of mockers. So the mockers are the ungodly, those who mock God. So they don't follow their lives or their counsel or their values. Now you might say, wait, doesn't this contradict what we just talked about over the last few weeks in God's space about the need to spend time with people that don't know the Lord? Well, really there's no uh, contradiction at all. There's a caution, of course, we're supposed to be in relationship with people that don't know Jesus, of course, but not to be influenced by their ways, not to be influenced by their world view. We love them, spend time with them, but absolutely reject uh, any ways uh, that, that go against what God would say, any values, any counsel that go against uh, the Lord. So, They delight, though, in the law of the Lord, verse 2. So he's referring here to the Bible. 
And of course, we have much more of the Bible than they did when this was written. They just had a small part of the Old Testament. We've got the whole finished Bible now. And they meditate on this law day and night. So the mark of the blessed person is not to take direction from the world around him or her, but to really press into the word of God, uh, to study it, to reflect on it, and to do the things that it says, like a very important instruction manual or a map. We desperately need this for direction in life. That's the perspective that this person has, the blessed one. Verse three says they're like a tree. That's a common metaphor in the Bible. Christians are like a tree. We can be like a tree that thrives or a tree that withers, good fruit or bad fruit. He says this person, because they're passionate, because they passionately follow God, they, they thrive. They're like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. So, so this is a person that has a very productive life. Even during times of drought, they prosper. Like perhaps you've been out in the desert and, and, and it's very arid and nothing much growing, but then you see a line of green and you just pretty much know that there's a river there even though you can't see it. So that's the idea there, that the, the roots of this person goes down deep into the riverbed of God's word. And they bear fruit. In other words, they have a life that blesses others. A, a life that, that blesses others. A, a life that, that provides shade and shelter. In other words, they're productive, they're fruitful, they're consistent. So this is a psalm about how to prosper, how to live the blessed life. There's a favor upon their life. It's the favor of God because they're walking in the truth. Now, this person isn't better. This person isn't deserving. They're simply living under the grace and the love of God. So that's the godly person. What about the wicked person? What happens to their life? Well, verse four, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. So in ancient times, they would beat the grain. It would be threshed to separate the kernel from the husk. And then they would throw it up in the air. And the wind would catch the chaff that's worthless and blow it away so that the grain that's valuable would remain. And when he says, this is, this is what the, the wicked are like. Their lives, tragically, like chaff, have no real benefit. And when their life is over, tragically, they'll find that what they lived for was in vain. It was empty, like chaff blown away. Verse five says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And I'm sure this is referring to all kinds of judgment for those who are without God and for those who are wicked. All kinds of different judgment, but especially talking about the judgment before God, that they won't stand, they won't survive that day they stand before the Lord. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. So in other words, the reason life goes better for them, the righteous, is because God is leading and guiding them. They have a personal relationship with God and they seek to honor him and to order their lives around the Lord and that relationship and his will. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And how true but sad and tragic that is, that destruction comes simply when we don't follow the heart and the way of God. It leads to all kinds of brokenness, broken relationship, broken bodies, broken dreams, broken communities. And on and on it goes, brokenness. So two ways, two different groups of people, two paths, two destinies. And here's our simple big idea today. That God's word is the path to life. And this psalm assures good news that God is for you. God loves you. He's not against you. He's passionate 
for us. And he deeply wants the best for us. And he's given us an amazing map, an amazing path. Not just the words of this book, but the relationship with the living God that goes along with it. And there's a companion scripture to this in Joshua 1, where Moses, after he has led the people out of Canaan, or yeah, out of Canaan and and into the desert uh, wanderings, Joshua had to take over after Moses died. It was a very intimidating kind of assignment because Moses arguably was the greatest leader of all time. And so Joshua, as a young man, has this this new role to lead the Israelites into the promised land. Verse 7 of Joshua 1, be strong and very courageous, God tells him. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Great scripture. Be careful. Be careful. For what? To obey all that it says. To do everything that God commands. Be careful. To do what? To not turn to the right or to the left. To stay on that path. And that's important because while probably all of us would say God's a lot smarter than we are, there are those times when we come to these decisions and we say, yeah, God, I know you say this, but... I kind of like this option better. In other words, I think I'm smarter than you are on this one. I'm sure there's none of us here that have had that attitude before. It's crazy that we can think that way. That's a core temptation for our lives to think that we know better than God. And God says, Joshua, don't do that. And he says to you and me, he says, don't, don't do that. There's a map to chart your course, to be obeyed. Stay on that path. Don't go to the left or to the right. Marriage decisions, finance decisions, sexuality decisions, work decisions, attitude adjustments. When we've been hurt or wronged in life, the list goes on and on. Will we go to the right, to the left, our own way, someone else's way, or stay on the path with the word of God? Thus says the Lord. A thus says the Lord kind of an attitude and lifestyle. That's what God wants, and that's why he's given us this word. And let me finish the big idea with a question. The word of God is the path of life. Are you on it? How are you doing in this? And then two specific questions that I think help unpack this for you and for me. Are you on this path? Number one, what is the word to you? So it's very obvious what the word is to the psalmist. It's the word of the Lord. And that's the view all throughout the Bible, right? The prophets, the apostles, given revelation from God to write supernaturally this amazing book. And it's why there's no book ever written like the Bible. So when we open this book, we are reading the very words of God. But the question is, what is the word to you? Like, what is it really to you and to me? We may say it's the word of God, but is it really? Because there's certain verses that, that we love. We'll even put these verses on our, 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 our wall, like at, like at home. We'll get these plaques and these different pictures and those, these you know, verses like, and I see these in homes, you know, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, you know, Joshua 24. Or how about this one, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What I've never seen, I've never seen a plaque with these verses. Romans 5, 3, we rejoice in our sufferings. (laughs) Never seen a plaque. Those those don't get purchased. Okay, I've never seen Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another. And I've never seen a verse on a wall, Luke 6, 27, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Those plaques don't sell. So what happens, we get in a situation where we've been hurt deeply, someone did some bad stuff to us, and we come to the word that says, love your enemies and pray for those who curse you, and we're like, I'm not so sure about that one, God, because you know what they did to me. In fact, God, I think you've given me a pass on this one. 
See what we do? We pick and choose what we want to obey and what we don't. We follow God in our marriage, but perhaps not in our finances. We may choose to help the poor, but we're not following God in our sexual life. We may love Christians, but then we don't love non-Christians. We pick and choose. And what's worse than that, we say to ourselves, well, I'm doing really good in, this, in, in these areas of my life with God, so I don't have to obey these areas yet. I don't want to get fanatical, you know. Well, if this really is the word of God, the roadmap to life, and then we follow it some of the time, but not all the time, it simply means two things. Number one, those times we don't follow it, we are the Lord. We know better. And number two, it's not going to go well for us. We're going to end up to the right or to the left and probably in a ditch. And our lives totaled. And then people will say, I don't understand. I'm following the Lord in my life. Why is this happening to me? And the simple reason is likely we're following God in some ways, but we decide not to follow in other ways, and those ways put us in a ditch. I was talking to my daughter, Natalie. She said something profound this week to a few of us. She was saying that... Uh, we talk about the cost of discipleship. And, and you know, there's a cost to discipleship and following the, following the Lord. He, he, he asked for our very life. But have we, this is what she said. She says, there's a cost to non-discipleship. Right? There's a huge cost to not following the Lord. Again, ditch, totaled life, destruction, brokenness. Powerful, powerful truth. So what's this word to you? Is it the word of God or, or, or just some of it? Do we like parts of it, reject others? Let's not be people that uh, pick and choose. Nobody knows better than the Lord on finances, on how to, how to be at work, on how to treat people, on your family, on forgiveness. No one knows better than God on sexuality. No one is smarter. No one's gonna give you a better life. Number two, not just what is the word to you, but how is your hunger for the word? How hungry are you? This psalm teaches that one of the marks of the person that truly is on the path to life, it's super clear, their delight is in the law of the Lord. They're passionate about God and his word. Now notice it doesn't say his duty is the law of the Lord, right? It says his delight, not his duty. So there's a lot of things we do in life out of duty because we know they're good for us, okay? So like I do vegetables out of duty, not delight. <laughs> it's more of like a duty thing. I, I, I try to work out and exercise regularly out of uh, duty, not delight. People ask me, do you enjoy working out? No. I enjoy after I work out is kind of how it goes. You ever heard people say, I got a couple of my kids that say this, that uh, they get runners high. They enjoy running because they get runners high. I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> they say, you just gotta go a little bit farther. I've jogged thousands of miles in my life. I even ran a marathon one time. I, all I, all I, the only thing that kicked in, pain. <laughs> Pain's the only thing that ever kicked in, not any runners high. Okay, well, we all get the principle of this. There's certain things we need to do, whether you get the high or it feels good or not. Okay, but, but that's not what this is saying here. Yes, it's good and important to read the Bible and to follow the Lord, even if you don't feel it, but there's a bigger goal, to delight in the law of the Lord. Psalm 119, oh, I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. This word meditate is the same word used for an anim animal chewing its cud. I know, a little disgusting. But when it comes to spiritual food, that's a cool truth. Like, just keep chewing on the word. Bring it back up. Keep meditating on it all day long. So at this point in your life and in my life, how hungry are we for the word? You know, our personal time every day, 
our desire, as it's awesome to see you here today, to be hearing the word and, you know, uh, jotting things down and looking forward, if, if you're in a life group, looking forward to get the group to talk about it and process it. And maybe if you miss, you know, catch the podcast. A lot of you are podcasting. You're podcasting the other teachings, uh, which are usually better than mine for sure. And you're catching those messages it's, it, it, you know, during the week um, and supplementing. And, you know, I have found that our, our walk with the Lord is kind of in direct relationship with our hunger for the word. There's a, it's like a thermometer. It sort of is a barometer of where we're at with God. How hungry are we for the scripture? Jeremiah 5, 16, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. I hope that's true of us. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And then Jesus, he put it back on Satan in Matthew 4, 4, tempted with food. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So just as our physical bodies are created to be nourished by food, so our spiritual lives are created to be fed by the word of God on a regular, consistent basis. And nothing else can meet that spiritual nourishment. No self-help, nothing, nobody else other than the sweet nourishing word of God. So I hope there's a hunger. And, and again, this is something we can be honest about, honest with God especially. God, I'm more hungry for other stuff right now. I'm more hungry for sports. I'm more hungry for hunting. I'm more hungry for shopping. I'm more hungry to build my business. I'm more hungry for whatever it might be. Not even bad things. could be very good things. But to be honest and say, God, help me. Help me to be hungry and to care about pursuing you. Because God, right now, I'm too full. You know, when you go, you go to maybe get a steak dinner, how foolish it is to fill up on a bunch of junk food before you go. We do that. We fill up on a bunch of stuff and we're not hungry. We don't have the appetite for the word of God. And you know, one of the things the scripture teaches is... There's another reason we don't have an appetite for the word is because we stopped really listening. You know, God speaks to those who listen. I'm not saying he doesn't speak to people who don't listen. But he really speaks to people who say, speak for your servant is listening. And maybe he used to speak more loudly in your life, but presently you might be in a season where God doesn't seem to be speaking loudly. And perhaps that's because he said some things to do or not to do. And we put our hands over our ears and la, 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 whatever. And so the Lord, we don't hear him. He's not speaking as clearly as when we say to him, God, would you please by your spirit give me that hunger for your word. I'll do the thing. You're smarter. You're wiser. My life belongs to you. I want to follow you. Speak to me. Only the Holy Spirit can really stoke that Activate that hunger in our hearts. And he will if we ask him, if we pursue him, and if we go after him in a way, well, you know, it's like when we, when we move our bodies and we work hard, we're going to get a better appetite. So it's the same idea as we pursue the Lord and we get more active in our faith, there'll be a greater appetite in our spiritual lives. Um, my good friend Kevin and I, we did this motorcycle ride in June. It was an off-road motorcycle ride. Um, we crossed all of Idaho on dirt, southern Idaho. We started at Wyoming, and in two days we were, uh, we were at Jordan Valley, Oregon. And it was just an epic, epic ride. And um, mountains, deserts, it's the beauty of that state, the southern, Oregon, or southern Idaho. It's, uh, it's just so, so beautiful. And... There was really only one way that we could do that, and that's because of a GPS, all right? A GPS with the, the tracks of our route put in, okay? It was put in, so this gets mounted to your handlebars, and you follow the blue line. Basically, there's a blue line, and the reason it's so important to follow that is because there's a gazillion roads and trails, no doubt. Like you're going along, and you have no idea where you're supposed to go. And, and it's, sometimes it's so counterintuitive because you're going on a really good road, and you're like looking at, the, you're looking at it, and you're veering away from the line. 
You're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm like over here and the line's over there. But it doesn't make any sense because I'm on a really good road. I'm on the better road. So then you go back and you go back and go back to where you were. Oh, there it is, a little goat path, right? Okay, but that's the route. That's the way to go. Sounds like the Bible, Jesus says, take the narrow road, right? The wide road leads to destruction. And, um, but it was such a, for me personally, just a great lesson about what the scripture is saying here that you, you gotta be looking at the word. You gotta be meditating on the word. Like on our trip, if we, if we would have well, I looked at it an hour ago. That's, that's not gonna work, right? You're, you're gonna, more than being in a ditch, you're gonna be out in some canyon somewhere. And, 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 and in that case, in our situation, that was, that was potential devastation, right? Because we're in the middle of nowhere, limited fuel. And, and, but guys, in our relationship with the Lord, it's even more high risk because of the danger of going to the right or to the left. It's a meditate on the scripture, meaning we're looking at it, we're looking at it again. Where, where am I? Where does God want me to be? And again, God has given us the most amazing GPS and the most brilliant map and the, the best blue line ever. You just got to stay, stay on that path. And we start getting off, not to get arrogant, not to think, oh, I think this way is really going to work. Okay, no, get back on that blue line. How about you? I hope you're on it. And if you're not, get on it today relationship with Jesus, following him in his word. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. You'll fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The presence of the Lord, the path to life. And I mention this one thing again, because there may be some of you here tonight and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. And there were some very strong words that were said here. The godly aren't smarter. The godly aren't better. The godly aren't more deserving. The godly just have Jesus. The godly have Jesus in our hearts. And the, the wicked, it says they won't stand in the judgment. And the reason they won't stand in the judgment is because they stand on their own before perfect holy God. People say, well, I like my chances before God. If you don't have Jesus, I'm going to tell you, I don't like your chances before God. You shouldn't like your chances before God because you must have your sins forgiven. You must stand before God under the righteousness of Christ. A gift freely given to those who repent and believe. Then godliness comes into us and the delight becomes a desire that he gives to us. And I hope that's where you're at if you have not done so yet. Let's pray together.